It says I'm live. I guess I should look into the camera when I greet you guys. It's time for the Walter Bosley channel. I don't know if you'd call this a show. It's definitely a live stream, stream cast kind of thing going on. But I welcome you all, uh, whether you're regulars, and especially if you're new. And this week, I think we will have a topic that you'll find interesting. Uh, it's in the realm of uh, adventure mysteries, I guess you could say. Um, I'm here with my um, tumbler of hot green tea. And I have my bright light on right now because I'm going to have to be able to read some selections from various books. And I want to be able to see as clearly as possible. Now, you guys know that I recently had some uh, procedures done on my eyes that, um, you know, they put new lenses in, they got rid of cataracts, but I still have floaters. So um, I thank you for your patience. If as I'm reading something, I pause until the floater floats away, so to speak. So, but I am working on that. <laughs> anyway, Lost Horizon. Now, it's based on a novel and it was turned into a film in 1937 by the legendary great director, Frank Capra. And it was remade um, in 19... Was it 73 or 70? I saw where somebody put 73, and I seem to recall it was before that, but it might have been 73. It would be interesting if it was 1973, because that's a transposition of the year of its release the first time as a film, 1937. You can note that for whatever reason. Um, the, the remake wasn't, wasn't very good, um, even though it had, uh, oh gosh, was it, was it Charles Boyer, I think, who played the High Lama? And it was a musical, and well, we'll forget about that. Anyway, and apparently there was some TV thing made in the late 90s that I'd never even heard of, but it's it's listed online. But uh, we're talking about the original 1937 uh, film by Frank Capra. Now, I have my notes here. Um, for those of you who haven't seen the film or read the book... Um, this is a reprint of the very famous uh, paperback edition uh, from 1933, I think. And as you see there, the tagline is the first paperback ever published. You know, some experts have pointed out that that's not exactly accurate, that there were paperbacks, uh, particularly when you look at the Penny Dreadful and the Pulp Era you know, prior to 1937. But what they're referring to is the first modern paperback as we know it um, still even today. And it indeed was that. But Lost Horizon is essentially about a man of high position, highly respected, a man of peace. And he's a diplomat, a British diplomat. And he's in... Um, uh, I want to say somewhere in India in the, in the book, as well as in the, in the film. And there's, you know, a big coup going on. It's chaos. There are people trying to flee where he's at. He's helping them. And he and a handful of others, um, foreigners like himself, foreign to the local region, uh, end up on the last plane out. And that plane has to uh, cross the Himalayas. But unexpectedly, they discover that um, it's not the uh, pilot and, and not the uh, destination that was intended. So they go deeper into the Himalayas, and the plane ultimately 
crashes, makes a safe crash landing in the in the snow. And they are met, they survive the, the crash landing, and they are met by uh, this um, uh, oh, this team, I guess, to receive them, right? Who take them farther into the mountains on this treacherous trail, and then they pass through this particular secret pass, and they end up in the beautiful valley known as Shangri-La. Now, we're all very familiar with the concept of Shangri-La, the paradise, which is, you know, high up um, in the Himalayas, um, surrounded by the, the, the very dangerous and impossible to cross, you know, snowy mountain range, icy and, and all that. And Shangri-La, um, you know, shouldn't be able to exist, but it does for reasons explained both in the story and in the film. Um, and they are welcomed with gracious hospitality by the, um, uh, sorry, I'm stumbling, by, by the uh, population, the leadership of the citizens of Shangri-La, um, where, the, you know, they can have wonderful food, um, they're, they're given comfortable clothing, and they learn about this small little breakaway group. It's a breakaway group when you learn more of the story that live away from the world. They want nothing to do with the outside world. And yet they keep up on what's going on outside their paradise. Okay. And they do have um, certain modern conveniences brought in very carefully. Um, to their, their secret enclave, their sanctuary, if you will, their Shangri-La, right? That's, it has become um, a, a hidden away sanctuary paradise has become synonymous with the name Shangri-La, right? So um, that's what we often refer to such places as. And along the way, the main character, the diplomat, uh, by the name of Conway, he, uh, falls in love with the place. He falls in love with a woman there. And um, he learns, I don't want to spoil the story for you, but he learns some things and an offer is made. He's very welcome there. Um, and uh, he, he chooses to leave to help someone, one of the others who, who just choose not to stay. See, they're not forced to stay. And each of them, Conway and this handful of others he's with, they each have their own story and their reasons for staying or thinking they want to go. And um, the way the story ends is that you don't know the fate of Conway. I'll leave it at that because I, I don't want to spoil it if you've never seen the film or if you've never read the book. But these are some of the basic concepts that I'll be sharing with you as far as the question, is Lost Horizon a true story to any extent? Now, you guys know me. I'm a nugget of truth kind of guy. And I have really liked this film for several years and um, particularly the, the book, I think I've read the book three times and get something out of it each of those times. And it certainly has an appeal, I think, to most people because who hasn't wanted to just run off to a paradise, a sanctuary, to just get away from the nutty, screwed up world, you know, that we live in. Uh, I, I think everybody's thought of that, considered it at one point or another. And that's why the story of Conway really does appeal to, to a lot of people. I think that's, that's why the story has maintained its charm and popularity for, um, for almost a hundred years. <laughs> but is there anything to it as far as, 
any actual people or events who inspired James Hilton, the author. Well, I looked into that. And I'm going to share with you what I found and ask some questions. Hmm. So let's get started. Now, I did post um, the uh, one of the original trailers for the 1937 film in the uh, community tab here at the Walter Bosley channel at the homepage that you can go check out if you're completely unfamiliar with the movie. You can you can watch that trailer. So um, let's see. Let us start with. Ooh. Um, sources say that um, a gentleman by the name of uh, uh, Lee Mallory, I didn't jot down his first name, I'll be darned, um, let, me, uh, let me look it up here, I can get this for you real quick. Lee Mallory was um, a mountain climber, uh, an adventurer. George was his first name. Okay, there. See how easy that was? George Lee Mallory, who was on a Mount Everest expedition and disappeared while attempting to um, reach the peak, or some may suspect returned from the peak. No one knows because he disappeared in 1924 and his story is credited with inspiring James Hilton to write Lost Horizon. And if you're familiar with the movie, if you've seen the movie or read the book, you'll know particularly why that um, story would inspire him. Well, when you look more closely, um, George Lee Mallory who, by the way, he's famous, probably most famous for one particular thing, and that is he's the guy who, when asked, why do you want to climb Mount Everest, replied, because it's there, right? We've all heard that story. Why do you want to do it? Because it's there. George Lee Mallory is the guy who said that, coined that phrase. And uh, I looked into his story and found that his body was discovered in 1999, positively identified, okay? Um, so if he had been the inspiration for Lost Horizon, um, well, it kind of uh, takes away the possibility of did he find his Shangri-La? But then you look more closely and you find out that on that same expedition, George Lee Mallory had a climbing partner named Andrew Irvine. Andrew Irvine also disappeared on the same day. And his body has never been found. Hmm. There have been those who claimed to have found his body and while they were on an ascent of Mount Everest, but they themselves died before they could come down from the mountain and return to civilization. In other words, they reported it to other people on, you know, an ex the expedition, but they themselves uh, were killed, uh, unfortunately, tragically on the mountain or died, you know, the various ways you can die, particularly when you're in the, the the danger zone up there, the kill zone, I think it's called, or death zone or something. Now, what's interesting is uh, George Lee Mallory was found with a hole, okay, uh, bashed into his skull, it, 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 a round hole, okay, not jagged rough like you expect a, a rock to do if falling sliding from heights and because there was an ice axe ice pick found in the vicinity and and could 
positively be identified as the type of ice pick or axe that um, Lee Mallory, George Lee Mallory and Irvine would have used. Um, it has been supposed that at some point during the fall or, or the cause of the fall, the, the ice pick uh, popped out of the ice or bounced off the ice or something and, and went into his head. There is no mention of what crossed my mind is that was he murdered? Now, there's nothing about Andrew Irvine that I could find that would suggest that he killed his climbing partner. In fact, Andrew Irvine was very respected. And I will come back to him at the end of this talk, okay? Um, but let's go into the idea of Shangri-La, first of all. Now, again, the concept is this um, uh, paradise okay, that's hidden away from the world, um, high up in the, the, the Himalayas, and um, very few people know that it's there, even know how to find it. <laughs> um, and this is a place where, particularly emphasized in the film, uh, people live for hundreds of years. There is this the secret of eternal youth can be found and um, is enjoyed there by the inhabitants of Shangri-La. Inhabitants, that's the word I was looking for a couple of moments ago. Sometimes it takes me a couple of minutes to get rolling here. And um, so, you know, Shangri-La, it's out there. It's been in lots of movies. It was um, uh, depicted uh, briefly in um, Sky Captain, okay, in the world of tomorrow. If you've seen Sky Captain, one of my favorite films, a lot of people, you know, eh, but I liked it a lot. And uh, it's just, it, it's, I, I guess in some cases it's a trope or whatever, but it has become so ingrained in popular culture that uh, you, you get the idea of a Shangri-La. But um, is there any reason to think that there was um, any real place or places that inspired such an idea? as Shangri-La in the story Lost Horizon. Well, let's take a look first at the work of uh, Alexandra David Neal. Now, this is uh, Magic and Mystery in Tibet, and um, many of you are familiar with this book. She spent years in Tibet um, among... Uh, various groups of the the lamas and magicians and sorcerers in tibet in in the uh, tibet and nepal and um this book if you've never read it and you're interested in these things this is a this is a must-have so let me see here okay now in in Lost Horizon, and I'm going to have to get into the story here a little bit. So, um, if uh, I'll tell you right now, spoiler alerts from now on. If you've never seen the film, if you've never read the book, stop right now. This is being recorded. Stop watching, and uh, take the opportunity to read the book or watch the film or both, and then come back and watch this after it's posted. You know, because um, it is being recorded. But from here on forward. I'm going to be discussing specifics of the story that uh, will spoil it for you if that kind of thing, you know, does spoil stories for you. In Lost Horizon, the High Lama um, reveals that he has selected Conway to essentially be his successor. Okay? He, he reveals that he has had his agents... Uh, outside of Shangri-La, out there in the world, watching Conway and reporting on Conway. And he knows Conway is a good man with a good soul and a good mind um, and a good heart, which is the, the, the least important of those three. I think a good soul and a good mind are superior to a good heart. You can't have the good heart without the other two. 
and you're not, you know, yeah. Anyway. Um, so he has tested him and not only has he been watching him, but he engineered the hijacking of the airplane to bring him to Shangri-La. And um, Conway's initial weeks in, in Shangri-La, in the valley, um, are part of that continued observation and that testing of um, Conway. Okay, so the whole thing, um, as far as why the Lama had the airplane hijacked and had Con the whole thing really was to get Conway to Shangri-La so that he could tell him more about the place and himself and um, reveal to him that he wants Conway to take over as the High Lama. Now, uh, Alexandra David Neal, interestingly enough, in her book, Magic and Mystery in Tibet, talks about um, Lama's special sages, masters, uh, who do this kind of thing. Now, uh, this book was first, well, the printing, this printing was 1956, but her research was done, um, oh gosh, sorry about that. Yeah, her, her research started, um, well, we know it started, I'm going to say it was prior to 1932 because the first edition of this book was 1932. Okay. That's when she, um, uh, first published this and that was the year before Lost Horizon was published, the novel. Okay. Um, she did a lot of her research in the twenties is what I was trying to say, but I was trying to get that specific for you. This, the 1956 edition is a very popular edition that you will see out there. So she had been doing her research, um, years before Hilton wrote the book. So, um, there's likely no doubt that Hilton was familiar with, uh, David Neal, because this is what, uh, she writes in the chapter on mystic theories and spiritual training. Okay. And uh, David Neal says, uh, the choice of the master who is to, uh, well, let me, let me give you a little bit so you understand the grammatical context here. It is unnecessary to be unnecessary, remember, to be an ordained monk to enter the short path to deliverance, which the short path often has to do with the more dangerous magical um, aspects, as she explains earlier in the book. I'll continue to read. According to its adepts, well, the reason it's important to emphasize it's unnecessary to be an ordained monk is because clearly Conway is not any kind of ordained um, ecclesiastical guy, right? Uh, reading again. According to its adepts, only initiations are of value. So any layman, if recognized as fit to undertake the spiritual climbing, may be accept accepted by a mystic master and in due time initiated by him. This is exactly what the High Lama does to Conway. The same rule applies to students of magic. Nevertheless, most mystics and magicians have begun their career as youths in the religious order. The choice of the master who is to guide him along the mystic path, arduous and fraught with deceitful mirages, is a momentous decision for the candidate to initiation. Now, Conway didn't choose the High Lama to be his master. Uh, really, you could say life has been Conway's master. Um, perhaps the High Lama not only observed Conway in the outside world, but uh, who's to say that the High Lama didn't maybe throw some challenges um, along the way in Conway's path of his life? OK, um, the High Lama could have been orchestrating some of the challenges that Conway rises to. OK. And continuing the course which his life, the adept or Conway, you could say, will follow depends to a great extent upon the character of the Lama he elects. So again, 
Conway didn't elect the Lama in the case of the novel, but um, we learn that the character of the High Lama is very much as high a character as Conway himself. For having asked admittance at a door from which they ought to have turned away, some have met with fantastic adventures. Now, look at that pass. They, they, they make a point in the novel, and particularly in the movie, that you reach a particular pass in the mountains that kind of represents the doorway into Shangri-La, into this other world. Okay, so consider that um, the door which Alexandra David Neal is talking about. For having asked admittance at a door from which they ought to have turned away, some have met with fantastic adventures. Now, a door that to, to turn away. I mean, you, you go up into those mountains, you shouldn't go, the average person would say you shouldn't go up into those mountains. It's way too treacherous. You, you, you might not even reach the door. So in, in what David Neal writes here, okay, about the spiritual path, we find um, metaphorically dramatized in Hilton's story and Capra's film. Yet if the young monk is satisfied with begging the spiritual guidance of a lama who is neither an anchorite nor an extremist of the short path, his novitiate will probably not include any tragic incidents. Now, this is important, too, within the context of Lost Horizon. If the young monk is satisfied with begging the spiritual guidance of a lama who is neither an anchorite nor an extremist, one of the main themes in Lost Horizon the film, and particularly in the novel, is moderation, okay? No one, no one among the inhabitants of Shangri-La are religious fanatics, nor are they not people of um, action in life. Uh, they, they don't, they don't uh, deprive themselves or others, yet neither do they um, uh, succumb to excess. It's moderation. And in this, in what David Neal writes from her research in the 1920s, um, you know, the spiritual guidance of a lama who is neither an anchorite, you know, someone who's a stick in the mud, nor an extremist. And isn't that interesting? And uh, at various points in the novel, it is expressed that the, the middle-of-the-road, moderate approach to existence um, kind of prevents what she calls tragic incidents, you know, what is expressed differently in different words in the novel, but it means the same thing. They avoid trouble. Moderation avoids severe trouble. That's the same thing that Alexandra David Neal is saying that she learned while in Tibet and Nepal in the 1920s. Continuing on, during a probation period of undetermined length, the master will test the character of his new disciple. Well, clearly, uh, Conway is tested by uh, through through the kidnapping, right? Hijacking of the plane, his kidnapping, in essence, the, the treacherous climb higher into the mountains and through the very dangerous pa uh, pass, okay, to get to Shangri-La. That, that's a test of one's character, of course. Uh, but also, remember, if the High Lama of Shangri-La were manipulating certain events and things in Conway's life in the outer world, that is also a, a test of character, right? A lifelong test of character, you could say. Continuing, uh, then the disciple, uh, no, then he may simply explain some philosophical treatises. That's the master may simply explain some philosophical treatises and the meaning of a few symbolic diagrams, uh, teaching him the methodic meditations for which they are used. Well, once um, Conway is brought to Shangri-La and, and first meets the High Lama, and then in all their meetings after that, the Lama is teaching him all about their philosophy and, and their way of life and their reasons for everything they do. If the Lama thinks his pupil capable of proceeding further, he will expound him the program of the mystic training. Um, 
The latter includes three stages, namely Tawa, to look or examine, Gampa, to think or meditate, and Kyodpa, to practice or realize. This is the fruit of accomplishment through two former stages. Another less current enumeration makes use of four terms to convey the same meaning as follows. The first stage is uh, ton, meaning or reason is what that means. That is to say, investigation of the nature of things, their origin, their end, the causes upon which they depend. And then lob, the study, lob or study of various doctrines. Now, um, in the first stage, obviously, um, Conway, you know, first being brought to Shangri-La and being allowed, he, they're allowed to move freely, by the way. They're allowed to go wherever, wherever they want in the valley. They're, they're not prisoners at all. So, you know, think about it. They're allowed to use their own reasoning to see why people stay in Shangri-La and don't want to leave. Okay, that's um, that's an investigation of the nature of things, as Alexandra David Neal points out, is one of the stages that masters use to teach disciples. Okay, and uh, also then the lob or study of various doctrines, that comes in when he starts, Conway starts meeting with the High Lama, and the High Lama starts teaching him their philosophy and why they do the things they do. And the third stage is togs, which means understanding. Now, ultimately, if you've read the book or seen the film, Conway comes to a complete understanding of Shangri-La, of the High Lama, of why being there is desirable, okay, and why he himself would want to be there. Um, now, there, there are other little clues to the various themes in um, Lost Horizon. For instance, Alexander David Neal writes, the word Psalms, T-S-A-M-S, Psalms, signifies a barrier, the border of a territory. In religious parlance, to stay in Psalms means to live in seclusion, to retire beyond a barrier which must not be passed. There's the very theme of Lost Horizon, specifically of Shangri-La. OK, it, they live in Psalms, as she says, the, the Tibetans taught her Psalms to live in seclusion beyond a barrier which must not be passed. Well, uh, duh, that's exactly how uh, James Hilton chose to characterize Shangri-La and, and where it's at. OK, and she says here in her book that so-called barrier may be of different kinds. With advanced mystics, it becomes purely psychic. And it is said that the latter need no material contrivances to isolate themselves while meditating. OK, uh, so um, proceeding from the less austere towards the most severe forms, we find the following ones. A lama or lay devotee shuts himself in his room or private apartment. He does not go out or only does so at fixed time to perform some devotional practices, such as walking around religious edifices, making repeated prostrations before sacred objects or the like. So you, you, you get the idea. And, and that last bit, the High Lama, part of it due to his age, but he never leaves his chambers. So um, really how Hilton characterizes the place and the High Lama and the process that the High Lama um puts Conway through um, to prepare him to become his successor is really right out of the Tibetan uh, tradition, okay, that Alexander David Neal had researched in the 1920s and had published by 1932, the year before Lost Horizon came out. So, you know, is, is she the only source of the idea of Shangri-La. Well, no. We have uh, also Nicholas Rourke. Rourke, okay? Now, those of you who are into, you know, the lost civilizations and the mystical this, that, or the other, you'll be familiar with Nicholas Rourke. You like how I describe that? The, the, myst the mystical this, that, or the other? Excuse me. Now it's a little dry there. Wow, I've been going... 30 minutes already. Hmm. I will probably, I might have to go beyond the hour mark um, before I get into uh, 
responding to live chat or um, taking questions. Now, um, there's just some brief stuff in Rorik that I want to share with you. Um, Nicholas Rorik, uh, interesting guy. Uh, it would be a whole... Um, be a whole series of shows to really explain to you everything about him and his associations. But uh, this book, Altai Himalaya, had to do with his um, journeys in the Himalayan, much the same places that Alexander David Neal explored around the same time, because um, he published this in 1929. And on the Altai, which is the high plain up there, as he's getting close to the Shangri-La zone, you might say. This book is is written in um, kind of a diary or journalistic mode, so there are short entries. But he writes something here that's interesting. Near Black Anui on Karagal, there are caves. The depths and distances are not known. There are bones and inscriptions. Caves. Depths and distances were not known in 1929. Are they now? Who knows? And he continues, and when we crossed Edigal, the broadness of Altai spread before us. It blossomed in all interblending green and blue shades. It became white with distant snow. The grass and the flowers stood the height of a man on horseback. One cannot even locate the horses in it. Nowhere have we seen such grassy vesture. Now there they are, Okay, high up in the Himalayas, and they find, you know, this, this valley, okay, blossomed, green, tall grass, grass and flowers higher than the horses, okay? Well, he's reporting what they, what this expedition actually saw. This, by the way, this is dated 1926, this uh, journal entry. Um, and they didn't see it. Nowhere have we seen such grassy venture, he says. That means through all this, I mean, and they're going through all this icy, snowy, stormy, and they find this, um, you know, uh, uh, pleasant, right, temperate little area. Well, are, are these the kind of places that, you know, inspired ideas of Shangri-La? That's the point. We have people going to the Himalayas reporting, um, you know, temperate zones with a lushness to the flora. Continuing. And Altean overtook us. Timorously, he peered at us. What kind of new foreigners had come to his country? Now, why is that important? Well, this is a local that they encounter. Um, if you recall, Shangri-La is depicted as being well-guarded. If you're not welcome there, um, when you read the novel, you learn this. If you're not welcome there, you, you are not helped to get there. Um, and uh, you are deterred, okay? So, you know, it's interesting that they encountered a local who was suspicious of them. What are you doing here, you know, in our, our sanctuary, you might say. Now, um, Rorik does write about Shambhala, which is the the uh, the place we find in the literature that many say inspired Shangri-La, the very name of it, you know, as well. Um, here's something interesting that uh, Rorick writes. One more image of Shambhala, the mandala of Shambhala will reveal to those who know some hints of reality. On the top is Yidam as the sign of elemental power and a figure that Tashi Lama, who wrote the very secret book, The Path of Shambhala. In the center of the image, the snow mountains form a circle. The snow mountains form a circle, right? Like mountain range, snowy mountains circling around what? Possibly a valley, okay? Reading on, you can recognize the three white borders, the snow. Okay, these are bordering some place, right? Uh, in the center is a seeming valley with many edifices. 
a valley with edifices, constructions, buildings, right? One can distinguish two plans as though they were the plans of towers. On the tower is he himself, that's capitalized, whose light glows in the predestined time. Below is the powerful legion leading victorious battle, the victory of the spirit on the great field of life. Now, that's a lot of symbolism, but basically what you've got there is Shambhala, 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 forgive my mixed pronunciations. Uh, that describes right there in 19, um, let me see when he, I think it was still 1926. This is in the Tibet section of the book. Yeah, I, I think it is still 1926 or maybe 27. Um, what he found there uh, in the writings on Shambhala is the very description, physical description of the idea of Shangri-La right there. So, you know, I think that Rorick was another obvious influence on Hilton in writing Lost Horizon, because that right there that I just read to you is the essential description of the location of Shangri-La, bordered by treacherous snowy mountain ranges, you know, and you've got your, your valley down there. Now, um, Rorick and Alexandra David Neal are not the only ones who have written about, um, had written about Tibet and the mysteries of Tibet um, in the time of uh, James Hilton. Um, as I said, one of the main themes of Lost Horizon is eternal youth. Now, T. Ilion is a very interesting writer. In his book, in secret Tibet, um, which was published in 1937, but uh, of course, his trip took place, uh, he planned the trip in 32, the trip took place, he left Germany in 34, and um, this book got published uh, in Germany in 1936, and in English, the, the the first one was 37, the year that the film Lost Horizon came out, and followed by another of his books I will be talking about here, Darkness Over Tibet, the year later in, in 1938. So this was, uh, his journeys were contemporary to um, the writing of Hilton's book, and then... Um, leading up to the release of the film. Now, it's important to note that um, he began, Ilian began the trip to Tibet, planning it in 1932. He doesn't leave Germany till 34. Um, is it possible that Ilian read Lost Horizon before going on his journey or during his journey? Absolutely. And we have to keep that in mind. But Remember, he's he's journeying to Tibet and he's learning things from the locals. So we, we have to keep that in mind. Anyway, in chapter seven of his first book in Secret Tibet, um, he writes about it's titled Eternal Youth. He's writing about this concept. Um, and he writes, the masses in Tibet make other mistakes, mostly of a so-called spiritual nature, and they also age prematurely. But the real Tibetan hermits manage to remain young almost indefinitely. There are rumors in Tibet that some of these men are five or six hundred years old. But such stories may be true or they may not be true. Well, obviously. It is impossible to prove a man's age once he is supposed to be several hundred years old since he outlives all witnesses. You know, even Ilian seems to get the humor of what he's saying here. However, some of these men who look like healthy men of about 35 years of age must be at least 100 years old, as very many old people living in the same districts have seen these men during 50 or 60 years or more of their own lives and declare they have not changed their appearance during this period and that they certainly have not grown older. Now, again, this is he's seeing these people in the you know, the local testimony is that they are much older than they appear. So Ilion asks, what is the secret of their practically everlasting youth? 
Um, let me, uh, well, the best opportunity of studying such a man was offered to me when I stayed for five days in the abode of a brother of one of my best friends in Tibet. Both are hermits. Now, let's pause there for a second. The whole idea of the hermit. What is the High Lama? He's essentially a, a hermit. And everybody who um, lives in Shangri-La, you, you could almost call it a, a hermitage, right? Um, they're living away from the outside world. So um, certainly Ilion found this concept of the hermit lives longer in the local culture, in the local beliefs, right? And alleged examples of this. So again, um, another concept that uh, Hilton may have learned from a scholar or, or you know, a, a source that knew firsthand. Um he, he goes on to talk about this hermit. He says that uh, these hermits do not share the view so common amongst the so-called saints of Tibet that dirt is a sign of holiness. They are just as clean outwardly as they are inwardly. Their clothes are neither rich nor excessively shabby. Now, neither rich nor excessively shabby. What What is that? That's moderation. There we have that moderation theme that Hilton um, threads through his novel Lost Horizon. And is depicted in the film, of course, uh, via the people of Shangri-La and the High Lama. So there, there is another theme that Hilton has in his uh, book. Um, Ilian speaks of uh, the Hil the uh, hermit. His he says this: his real age, judging from the reliable statements of numerous old people who had seen him many decades ago, must have been ninety years at least. So this hermit who looks decades younger, um, has to be supposedly at least 90 years old. Um, the thing that Ilian comes away with in a conversation with the hermit is this. Um, listen very carefully. The moment you make an effort to remain young, you get older. The very moment you make an effort to keep something, you are afraid to lose it. And fear poisons a man. It is fear that destroys people's youth. Okay, and that's what uh, Ilian comes away with. Now, in Lost Horizon, the novel, and in the film, we see that the High Lama sees in Conway um, a lack of fear. And when you read the novel, and particularly, you know, you watch the film, Ronald Coleman plays Conway. They changed the first name for some reason. You see that he's not a man of emotion. He's a man of moderate temperament. He is the, you know, um, the least fearful. Even the, uh, the, the businessman there, um, who is a capable, strong guy with a can-do attitude, he has some fears that drive him to do some kind of criminal things. Um, so even he lets ultimately, this is in his background and in some of the behavior you see, he lets his, his fear of being caught, so to speak, make him do irrational things. But Conway is the most level-headed, most moderate, really most fearless of the group. So, um, you know, what Ilion wrote in the 30s that he found, you know, from this hermit who was allegedly many, many, many years older than he appeared to be, is that you, you have to control your fear. And again, we see this reflected in Conway and among the reasons that the High Lama selects Conway to succeed him. Now, um, Another interesting source uh, relating to things Shangri-La is uh, uh, Mar the Marquis Alexandre St. Ives d'Alvedra. Now, this is a book sent to me by our friend Nimza Fligzug. Fl 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 <laughs> I can't even pronounce You know, our friend Nimza, okay? Hello, Nimza, if you're out there. Um, and, and let me read... Um, this book, this book is greatly a product of, you know, the uh, the th theosophy, um, spiritualist, what became New Age, you know, but the theosophy, theosophist, um, uh, spiritualist era, right? 
the whole Agartha thing, but it still has some very important pertinent information. Um, now, this book here was uh, published first in, let me get this here. Let me find, come on now. Well, gosh. This was, let's see, supposedly left India after the revolt of the sepoys. Wow, they don't have the quick go-to verso page with the publishing history. I apologize for this. Um, I think this was written in the 1890s, okay? So, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, um, anyway, well over 100 years ago, many years before Hilton wrote his uh, his novel. But the concept of a garta, a garta is a very similar concept to Shambhala, you know, which are the inspirations uh, essentially for a Shangri-La type of place. A garta, of course, being at the hollow earth, because this is his book, Kingdom of a Garda, A Journey into the Hollow Earth. Um, now, we have to cover a garda and related themes because... Well, when we return to Ilion here, eventually you'll see why we need to approach these things sometimes as a cautionary tale, okay? Um, but this is what um, Dalvedra writes in his book on Agartha. On the surface and in the bowels of the earth, the true extent of Agartha defies the embrace and constraint of profanation and violence. What does that mean? That's an 1890s way of saying um, it, it avoids the uh, problems and, and bad things in the world outside, okay? Uh, reading again, in Asia alone, there are half a billion people who are more or less aware of its existence and its greatness, not to mention America, whose subterranean regions belong to Agartha in very remote antiquity. Now, that's a really interesting statement that deserves its own uh, show, an episode down the road, right? Because that right there speaks to the belief of the mysterious tunnels, you know, in South America. And, and you know, the cavern systems and tunnels that many, you know, have pointed out, well, we know the cavern systems are real, but the potential for the ancient tunnels here in North America as well. Reading on, Devedra says, but nowhere will there be found among them a traitor who would provide the precise location where its council of God and its council of gods, these are capitalized, so they're proper names of organizations, its pontifical head and its judicial heart are located. Nowhere will there be found among them the denizens of Agartha or those who know it's there. Not, not just the citizens of Agartha, but those who are even aware of its existence, who don't live there, there will not be found among them a trader who would provide the precise location. So again, like Shangri-La, everybody involved, everybody aware plays along. They, they don't want the outside world soiling the sanctuary. Okay, now uh, continuing on, um, another thing that Devedra writes is, by, by calling to their aid the cosmic powers of earth and heaven, the Templars, not the Knights Templar, but just people of their own temples, and the Confederates of Agartha, even in defeat, could blow up a part of the planet if necessary, destroying these profaners and their country of origin in a cataclysm. Think of the stories and suspicions and hypotheses of lost powerful ancient technology think of the mahabharata and the weaponry discussed in there think of you know the various um stories uh, attributed to so-called um you know ancient ones coming from other places with terrible weaponry and and stuff um you know this was written in the 1890s before our nuclear age and bef before you know at least that stuff, even though it's greatly a product of the era of theosophy and spiritualism, which has a lot of questionable, an incredible amount of questionable stuff out there. Um, just think about that. Uh, I'll read it again. By calling to their aid the cosmic powers of earth and heaven, the Templars and the Confederates of Agarda, even in defeat, 
could blow up a part of the planet if necessary, destroying these profaners and their country of origin in a cataclysm. That's, wow, That's I find that real, real interesting. Um, so that speaks to the power of Agartha. Now, I think it's very subtle, but I think what's hinted at in Lost Horizon is their ability to defend their position and to remain untampered with by the outside world. Um, again, just more, we're talking about, you know, any kind of um, source that James Hilton based um, Shangri-La and the characters in his, you know, of Lost Horizon and the characters of the story on, you know, any real people, any, you know, literature, real places, supposed real places, you know, we're looking at the possible sources um, of Lost Horizon, maybe, maybe the true story behind it. So um, now to go to um, Henning Haslin, who was a member of the Sven Hedden expedition into you know, this region and Mongolia. This is the book Men and Gods in Mongolia, uh, published in 1935. Um, and let's see. The journeys related in this book, here's a map inside the book, were between um, 1927 and 1930. So this, again, is that era of Alexandra David Neal, of Nicholas Rorick, um, of uh, right before Ilion, but uh, also before James Hilton Wright's Lost Horizon. And um, Haslin writes, oh, oh before, before we get to, to this, um, returning to James Hilton's novel, um, at one point, the Lama reveals who he is. He is a French priest named Perrault, okay, who um, found himself high up in the Himalayas and uh, brought safely into Shangri-La in the early 18th century. By the time... Conway meets him. He's uh, around 250 years old. Okay. Is Peralt based on any one who actually allegedly lived? Well, it's interesting what Haslin writes in Men and Gods in Mongolia. This is in the chapter, The Oasis Beyond the Desert. Okay, they're talking about a sanctuary, a paradise beyond a uh, decidedly unparadisical kind of environment, right? And this is what Haslin writes. He refers to uh, Pershavalsky, okay? When Pershavalsky, the first European traveler to do so in modern times, visited Charklik in 1876, it was a new community in, in, in its habit, blah, 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 so forth. Um, on the return journey, the, um, the original inhabitants' ancestors followed Marco Polo's long-forgotten route and on, and on and so forth. Uh, there was luxuriant growth in the fields and gardens of this paradisical sanctuary, this oasis uh, of Charklik. And everywhere there was the delicious sound of murmuring water from the numerous irrigation canals. Cooling fruits and all kinds of appetizing products of the soil lay in the open shops, and the bazaar was full of contentedly smiling people. An enormous distance separates the place from the nearest outposts of civilization, civilizations, and we had a strong sense of the charm of living in conditions which seemed unchanged since the days of Marco Polo. Okay? Um, we ourselves prepared to enjoy the novelty of our surroundings and imagined ourselves living in long-vanished times. I, that right there is the very basic plot of lost horizon right um haslin also writes let's go to this um at another point uh later on in in, in when they're up in the uh, snowy mountains 
going through treacherous territory. The farther we penetrated into the mountains, the deeper lay the snow. And on the fourth day of the march, the last vestige of a path disappeared beneath three foot drifts. The passes on our way were so ice covered that the small ponies could not find any foothold. And on several occasions, we had to return to the last camping place in order to seek a new line of advance along another canyon. On the 10th day of our journey, we had strayed to the foot of a pass which had before us only been climbed by mountain sheep, rock goats, and in the intrepid hunters who followed their trail. Here a snowstorm came upon us, and to save the last powers of the already exhausted horses for the climb and better weather, we were compelled to camp. And after a day and night, the snowstorm ceased as suddenly as it had begun. The sunrise spread its beauty over a glistening white fairy landscape, and the sun brought warmth and cheer to both man and beast. The horses, lately so dispirited, shook the frost off their coats and began to paw the snow, seeking for fodder. Toen Gelling pointed happily to the southward, where behind sharp ridges a saddle-shaped pass broke the line of a lustrous mountain wall against the blue January sky. The pass was Tekin Dawan itself, the Rock Goats Pass, which is the entrance to the Torgut country. And Shagadir, one of their guides, came back happy and hopeful, for he had found fresh human tracks leading in the direction of the pass. Okay, they follow these tracks. Now he writes, the foot tracks in the snow encouraged us, and we were full of gratitude to our unseen guide and of admiration of the hard struggle he had fought out alone against the raging elements. His tracks were deeply imprinted in the new fallen snow, but half filled up again, which showed that he had performed this severe climb during the actual storm. Somebody, he doesn't know who, went through this dangerous pass during the storm that they had to camp out during and take shelter from. And, and somebody, he doesn't know who, went along this path and they're following his footprints, his tracks. The nearer we came to the summit of the pass, the more eager became our efforts. The Torgutes were impatient to see once more the known features of their country. For the last hour, okay, as the, 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 the tracks fade, by the way. For the last hour, we had no track to follow. At the point where it ceased, sat the half-snowed-under body of a man. When the targets passed it, or when we passed it, the targets had said prayers to appease Yama, the great god of death, but Toen Gelling had tarried with the dead man. The, uh, uh, if one looks on, they, they continue through the pass. And he writes, the sight of the sacred mountain made us forget all our perils and hardships. Well, you know, that right there, the description of that treacherous path, pass, and the path they follow of the unknown um, uh, traveler, and then they find a body. He doesn't say if it's the body of the, the mysterious person, you know, who left the tracks. And they, by following the tracks in that direction, they come to their destination. Well, that... That's like right out of um, Lost Horizon, right? When they're led uh, safely, you know, more overtly by the guides. But, um, you know, there are bodies along the way, you know, who didn't make it. And, you know, right there we have Haslin writing about this again just a few years before Hilton writes his novel. So um, the last thing that I'm going to read um, to you is the dark side to such a concept. And um, this is T. Ilian's other book, Darkness Over Tibet. Now, Darkness, I think, 19, uh, what was it, 1938, okay? It was the year before the film Lost Horizon came out. And um, in the chapter titled, a long chapter, titled The Underground City of the Initiates, um, Ilian has a completely different experience than Conway and them have in Shangri-La and certainly others, you know, have had as explained. This one he finds in this underground city is a place of uh, drudgery, ultimately, um, sadness in a form of slavery. And what finally drives him away uh, is the following. And again, this is from Ilian. Uh, I was in the so-called kitchen of the city, 
to which no one except the kitchen staff and the highest initiates had access. A human corpse lay in the center of the kitchen, lifeless and automaton-like cooks. The cooks were like automatons, just dully going through the actions. Lifeless and automaton-like cooks cut off small pieces of flesh. Ten or fifteen large pans made of massive silver were suspended over so many fires, apparently fed with alcohol, and the pieces of human flesh were passed on to boards where they were carefully cut up into small pieces. It was not quite certain, of course, that the contents of the silver pans were destined for the members and guests of the holy city, but the very possibility of my having partaken of such food was dreadful. If human flesh was actually mixed into our food, it was small wonder that it had disagreed with me. The cooks gave a mighty stare at the intruder, but two or three seconds were enough to have a look at the whole kitchen, and I immediately rushed back to the guest house. He basically... He basically packed up and fled um, the underground city. Um, so there's a case of paradise not gone wrong but discovered to be not such a wonderful place there's the dark side of um, shutting yourself off in a hermitage um, but I, I read that to uh, illustrate that this literature this literary tradition um, from which James Hilton clearly took tons of inspiration um, is rich with both uh, positive uh, and illuminating accounts and uh, stories and claims, um, and and also dark, very dark stuff, as as you can see. So we come back to um, Andrew Irvine, right? And we are told that um, Hilton was inspired by George Lee Mallory's disappearance. But um, Mallory's body was found. The one who was never found was this Andrew Irvine. Now, Andrew Irvine was rather brilliant. When you look him up, he, uh, he was a natural at, at mechanical engineering. And um, just he, he was like, you know, Johnny on the spot with knowing how to handle any given situation. Uh, the reason Mallory took him up to the peak was um, he was far superior than the more experienced guys at um, uh, 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 rigging the oxygen bottles that they carried with them then. And Mallory realized, man, if I'm going to survive, I've got my best chance of survival with Andrew Irvine. Um you know, but but he was also known as again a level-headed guy, um, a very good climber. Um, you know, just a you know a, a, a man of action where necessary, and fearless. Um, wow, he's sounding a lot like Conway of the novel. And, and in my mind, um, he seems more to be an inspiration for Conway than than George Lee Mallory. And he remains missing to this day. And then there's the issue of that ice pick hole um, pierced into uh, George Lee Mallory's head. Um, you're left with wondering until they find Irvine's body, we're left with the uh, delightful speculation you know, the entertaining question, was Irvine taken to a Shangri-La or was he taken to uh, Ilion's more dark place? Could George Lee Mallory have reacted in some way that uh, one of the inhabitants, denizens of the uh, mysterious place have killed him? And they took Irvine in his stead. This happened in 1924, by the way, nine years before Hilton wrote uh, Lost Horizon. So all of this, I think, makes Lost Horizon a 
much more interesting story than it even is on the face of it. And uh, again, if you haven't read it, read this book. If you have, read it again. Like I said, I've read it three times and have enjoyed it every time. Um, and now that I know even more, uh, you know, about the background and how it connects to, um, you know, literature I've already been familiar with for years before I knew of any, um, you know, connection between the mountain climbers and Hilton's inspirations. Um, it makes this an even more interesting book for me because you guys know I always love and I'm drawn to, you know, the 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 nugget of truth in something extraordinary. So um, that's what I wanted to present. I will go to the live chat and I will take questions and please keep your questions until I state otherwise, keep your questions on the subject that I've just been spending an hour talking about, if, if you don't mind. And then after we exhaust that, then we'll go into other general things. And then I'll make announcements and stuff, you know, updates. So Let me see. I think if I, oh, okay, there we go. Okay, now I can see the chat going in. Let me turn this bright light off there. And Shaverman. <laughs> Jeff Limp, oh, wait a minute. Jeff Limpert says, okay, I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm just going to look at what's on the screen. Okay. Jeff Limpert says, I'm in and out of the show and we'll re rewatch later. I hope you cover. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't, but um, I will, uh, oops, sorry. You guys want to still be able to see me. <laughs> so I will see the questions. Um, Webmeister Malia will put the questions up on the screen or the comments. Nick N says, what is Rourke's book name you had there? His art is excellent. Oh yeah. It's Altai Himalaya. Very famous book. Very well-known um, Nicholas Rourke book. Altai Himalaya. You can get that through Adventures Unlimited Press. I have been busy in the meantime, while I'm waiting for the next comment or question, I uh, have been very busy, um, uh, you know, working on getting books out. Oh, as you know, uh, Giza Death Star Destroyed, the second book of uh, Joseph Farrell's trilogy has been released. It's available, folks. Uh, so now you can get the Giza Death Star and you can get the Giza Death Star Deployed. I'm sorry, I said destroyed. Uh, deployed. The Giza Death Star Deployed is available as of this week um people are already jumping on it uh the giza death star destroyed will be coming out very soon okay and then we'll have um we'll have uh, all three books of the trilogy the book of werewolves edited by sabine bearing gold edited by todd wood and myself that will be out soon 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 it's coming along and there's another, um, uh, Seshari's Wonder of the Worlds hardcover is on its way. It's being worked, but that one, I'm, I'm paying extra, extra attention to detail uh, for that very special volume. And I have another surprise coming out for you here sooner than you think. Um, Beverly Weisenberger asks, would I go to Shangri-La? Yes, in a heartbeat. I wouldn't. Wouldn't waste time. Raphael Reeves, is there more info regarding Nicholas Rourke's sighting of a UFO? Not that I'm aware of. I think all we know is what he says in, in the book. Um, and everything other than that is, you know, analysis, hypothesis. Remember, Nicholas Rourke was... Um, associated with the then vice president of the United States who got into a little, you know, uh, social trouble or public, you know, trouble with the public for, um, uh, in a friendly manner, referring to Rorick as his guru, 
you know, um, people took that, you know, they clutched their pearls. And um, I would say if you want to learn some very interesting thing about Nick Rourke and his connections, uh, go uh, follow dark journalists um, discussions um, of him and his associates and related things over the last couple of years. He's talked about Nicholas Rourke more than once. Nick N says, you mentioned authors talking about physical guides. What about psychic type guides or prompts leading to these places? Have you run across anything like that? Well, I think that was, uh, Nick, I think that's, uh, was kind of alluded to, but is certainly implied when, um, I think when I was, uh, quoting from Hasland, um, maybe Devedra, where the uh, adept who seeks to reach the places doesn't necessarily, it, it can get there through meditation, so to speak, can find their way there through meditation. So um, it, that is part of the literature. Now, naturally, when you get into the theosophist and spiritualist era, you find all sorts of people claiming that. So um, I leave that for you, the individual, to decide. Um, you'll notice I never proselytize anything um, discussing philosophical or theological concepts and, and ideas and expressing your opinions or beliefs or unbelief of them. Um, these are not the same as proselytizing. And sometimes people confuse a mere discussion with preaching and they're just wrapped a little too tight in that regard and they need to rethink that you know but um i never proselytize uh rafael reeves by the way great looking video said thank you thank you um i i thank my uh webmeister malia grim pierce tessier ashpool is it rorick it's it's r o E R I blah 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 I C H. I have the book right here. Let me look so I get that right for you. I, um, yeah, I was right. R O E R I C H Rourke, and and a lot of people pronounce it Rourke. Johnny side, do you think there could be other Shangri La on other continents or mountains? Yeah, and and I think that's kind of the point that these researchers and explorers were uh, finding and and making is that each um, each region seems to have their, their, uh, temperate zone sanctuary. And the idea is that Hilton drew inspiration for his fictional Shangri-La from the reports of these kinds of temperate zones. Antarctica. Um, yeah, why not? Why couldn't Antarctica have it? Now, a materialist, would say, well, because scientists tell us blah, blah, blah. But, um, uh, you know, we, we, we've heard these uh, apocryphal tales of temperate zones being found in both Antarctica and the Arctic. Thank you, Nick. Again, I thank uh, Malia Grimm, who's shaping things up. Hans Messerschmidt asks, Buddhism in Tibetan lore, talk a lot about Mount Meru. Indeed, they do. Shangri-La and serious connections. Thoughts? Well, any mention, if I'm not mistaken, any mention of Shangri-La after um, it, it, it comes after Hilton's book in film. I, I think he made up that name. Um, what was the... Uh, and, and the serious connections, that, of course, I think is... is um, I'm not saying there's nothing to it. What I'm saying is that uh, now Mount Maru, yes, that's an old concept. Absolutely. Shangri-La itself, that's a creation of James Hilton as such, the name and stuff. And then, of course, serious connections wouldn't surprise me because the serious thing is weird. Robert Huffine asks, Walter, would a Shangri-La be hidden deep in the tunnel systems of South America? Uh Possibly. Again, would it not depend on the character of the people founding it, establishing it, or running it, the character of the culture, right? Um, and, and think about it. These are breakaway groups. Uh, any kind of Shangri-La type of society that, that is off living in a hermitage, doing its own thing or whatever, only, only vaguely or very sparsely having any choice of connection or reliance on the outside world that's a breakaway group and um certainly 
but it could go either way, Robert. Um, it, it could go either way. It could be a good place like Hilton Shangri-La or the Shambhala of the tradition, or it could be like the underground city that Ilion claims that he experienced. Shalom, Shambhala is also in that for, I think that's a typo. So in that, okay. Very weird. Okay, I will open it up to uh, questions about anything you may have, all subjects. Um, now, uh, by the way, as far as my own writing being inspired, um, my, my fun action-adventure um, homage to 60s, um, you know, men's action stories uh, titled Rakshasa Runout. Um, takes place in uh, the Hindu Kush, because as you know, I spent a few times in Afghanistan and Kabul and, and you know, at the, at the foot of the Hindu Kush and, um, and flying over those mountains multiple times, uh, like, like Conway and the, the plane that, you know, takes him to Shangri-La. Um, and it's a very inspirational, beautiful part of the world in that regard. Pierce Tessier Ashpool asks, have you seen any of those breakaway towns from when you were working? Um, not that I would admit. In the Air Force or, some, or something. I like how you say or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was or something when I got this shirt. <laughs> uh Philip Blair, observation, actors who look Tibetan are not often named Charles. Yeah, Philip, that's true. But you know what? Um, Bill Burr and others have pointed out that uh, this idea that you got to get, you always have to get, you know, um, you know, a person to play what they are, uh, you know, I'll leave it to you to refer to uh, to Bill Burr and their opinions on that. I mean, um, I'm certainly not opposed to, you know, if you have a Tibetan character, get a Tibetan or at least, you know, an Asian actor, you know, because you're going to get, you know, even more um, authenticity, of course. But neither do I condemn, particularly decades ago, you know, dating back to 1937 or 1973 even, I'm not going to condemn you know, um, they got Charles Boyer. Oh, and, and hold on, by the way, Philip, <laughs> dummy us, you're making the mistake. The High Lama is not Tibetan. He's French. So it's absolutely proper for Charles Boyer to have played the High Lama because Lama is just a title. Okay. He's actually Father Perrault, a Frenchman. So golly, um, there you go. No, nobody did anything, did any offensive casting. Um, but, uh, but I, I'm glad you asked that because I am someone who reprints classic adventure literature and, and likes the old movies and stuff. And, you know, people point out, you know, well, they did this wrong. They did that wrong in the past. And, you know, um, I do have my lines that there are things I will not reprint, um, you know, uh, because, you know, they, regardless of them being an author of their times by their times, if you know your history, they should have known better than to write the things they did. But I, I have my lines, you know, uh, Philip Blair says, I like it when a story is easy to get into like Martin Scorsese's Kundun. Yes. My son loved that movie from the time he was a kid Kundun. So And Smesher said, many Tibetans changed their names moving to the USA. Oh, okay, you're referring to, yeah, he was referring to Charles Boyer having played the High Lama, but I remind you that in the story, the High Lama is not Tibetan. Um, he is French, and Charles Boyer was very French, you might say. Any other questions or comments? Pierce Tessier Ashpool says, my great-grandfather was a Templar. I have a ceremonial sword. Oh, cool. That's interesting. 
Nick N, when you mentioned the first body being found up there, at first I thought it was an Empire of the Wheel fake substitute. <laughs> yes, isn't it? You're right. Yeah. I mean, who knows, right? Just like um, in that pass where uh, they're, they're following these footprints, feet print in the snow, and then, you know, the feet print disappear, and then they find a body. Well, shouldn't, I, I mean, shouldn't those feet print have led to the body if it was, you know, made by the, the dead guy? Or, you know, going back to um, uh, Mallory, you know, did Irvine or someone he was with kill him? Who knows? Solite, US expat says maybe the guy still missing fell into a crowd well yeah that's that's the, you have to go with that being the most likely reason they've never found his body he fell into a crevice you know yeah a deep crevasse just and and as we know those exist up there right um you know and they'll never be found how many people have fallen into those that we'll just we'll never find them yeah. so and let's see, let's see. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Masters Maniac Mexico. Thank you very much for this. Again, more than interesting lecture in your fearless reference to certain German literature. Fearless reference to certain German literature. Oh, you mean Ilion or Hasland? Hey, you know, the literature is out there. Um, so, you know, Philip Blair, would you like to visit Tibet, Bhutan, under the Tibetan culture reason? Oh, hell yeah. Um, the first place, when I got it into my head as a young man, that I really wanted to do world travel, the first place I wanted to go is India. And I had, uh, I took an elective course, um, world religion. It was an elective that I had to earn some credits, you know, towards the end of college. And uh, the professor, he and his family had spent years in India, and he shared a lot of his personal uh, photographs. I mean, he had what must have been thousands of slides. And we sat there, and I just fell in love with the idea of going to India. And I've wanted to get there. The closest I've been was on the job to uh, Pakistan. I had to work in Islamabad and then Karachi. And that's the, uh, the, the closest I've come to India. Of course, as you know, I've been to other stands. But um, India, I, I haven't made it yet. I really want to go there. Of course, I would love to go to Nepal and Tibet as well, obviously. Um, Hans Messerschmitt, growing up in Nepal, familiar with Tibetan and Nepali name changes, but missed the initial. Uh, Cole Brady asks, have you ever... Have you heard of the 1920s Russian expeditions of Bokia and Barchenko? And Bloomkin claimed the Tibetan monks initiated him and took him in a labyrinth, showing him relics from five prior civilizations. This sounds familiar. It sounds similar to um, T. Lobsang Rampa um, books. You know, uh, take those with a grain of salt. But this kind of idea of being taken into this deep um, underground place and shown, you know, um, relics of, of past lost civilizations. Uh, I have not, uh, honestly, I'll admit, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not familiar with Bokia and Barchanko and Bloomkin. So I'm going to um, look them up, Brad Cole Brady. Thank you very much. Um, I love reading about this stuff. Pierce Tessier Ashpool. I'm pretty sure the Air Force had a Tibetan child they were learning from in the 90s. I wonder where those German translations of that book is. I can't spell the name of it. Nepal, the Nephilim. That's interesting. Hans Messerschmitt. Wow, Islamabad and Karachi. Been to both. Yep, indeed. I, you know, I was bummed that my uh, work kept me from getting some personal time to go see Mohenjo Daro. I mean, there I was, you know, right there in Pakistan um, and just didn't get the chance to go there to that interesting site. Solite US expat. One of my friends saw a yogi levitating in the middle of the Ganges River. He also met a couple that saw a yogi meditating on the foothills of the Himalayas, dissolving into light and then coming back. That's interesting. 
That's a curious thing. We had a yogi um, right here. Uh, there's a town here called Yakaipa, and there's uh, an area beyond that, Oak Glen, that you go to at the foothills of the mountains. And there was uh, a, a campground um, that was called Jellystone Park, fashioned after the cartoons. And they had a big statue of Yogi, you know, Yogi Bear. I'm not making fun of you. I, I just took the opportunity. I couldn't pass it up. <laughs> David Paff says, The Snow Leopard is perhaps, to me anyway, the best lyrically written book with references to philosophers I have read deeply. It won National Book Award, which I think should have been Pulitzer. Uh, the Snow Leopard, you know what, David? I think I have a copy of that somewhere, and I, I need to read it. Oh, there's my tea right there. Any more questions or comments about anything coming up? Any books? Any? Um, are you guys liking? Uh, some of you have expressed that you like the new format. Um, I am lining. I, I have been talking to other future guests that you guys you're gonna love these guests. I'm telling you, um, and they've all assured me they want to come on, do the show. Um, but it's got to be after the first of the year. Um, one of them is traveling out of the country right now. And by the time he gets back, it'll be the holidays. So it's going to be after the new year. Same. Another one is not traveling, but um, he's swamped and it'll be after the, you know, the new year. Um, and a third, maybe in December, maybe next month, I can get him to come on. So um, David Paff says, you're looking well. And yes, love the new format. Thank you, David. Uh, Brian Smith says, it's great. I, I will fish for those compliments. Thank you. Thank you. Soul Light US Expat says, a friend whose father was a mystic that would levitate above his bed while sleeping. Dr. Joe Gallenberger, retired clinical psychologist, knew someone using resonant tuning to dissolve into light. Oh, okay. I like so light. What I like about that is, is it, it, it gets it, it at least, at least nods toward how they were doing it. Right. Uh, because I have no doubt somebody's going to come up with a very technical real world material way to do these kinds of things, to, to effectively do these kinds of things. Robert Huffine says, love the new format. Can't wait for your guest. I can't wait either. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. Yes. Malia is definitely doing a great job. I, I appreciate her energy and effort to do this. And, um, we have some other interesting things coming down the road. Um, Pierce Tessier Ashpool. Do you know anyone in the white mountains? I'm looking for work. Uh, where are the white mountains? Thank you, Hans. Hans. Philip Blair, have you read Rainbow Body and Resurrection by Father Francis V. Tiso? Nope. Walter Mosley Channel about his expedition to Tibet and research of rainbow body lore. Uh, no, but I'll look him up because uh, I love reading about this stuff. I, I come to my own personal conclusions or opinions about what I read, but I, I love reading about this stuff. Brian Smith asked, did you get my crazy email with the Michael Harner link? I don't know if I sent it to the right email. Uh, I'll look again. Um, I'll look again. Oh, Vermont, the White Mountains of Vermont. Do I know anyone? Not off the top of my head, but I'll think about that and let you know. Farah Jade, is this show going to be available to watch later? Yes. As usual, I missed the first half. Yes, Farah, the, with the new format and the way I'm doing things now, um, yeah, these I'm not taking shows down. Um, so, let me see if there's. Um, if you haven't uh, lost Amazon 9, Brian Smith, that's it. Um, here's one of the uh, bookmarks I had made years ago. I'm going to be making these available again. And if you haven't been yet, lostcontinentlibrary.com. 
it's active, it's live, it's in, it, it, it's still in progress, right? It's not ultimately what it's going to be, but it's active, it's live, you can go there, lostcon at library.com. That's where, from now on, when people say, where can we get your books? Where can we see your films? Where do we see your articles? Where do we get merchandise? Okay, because merchandise is not evil, folks. We live in a, a, a commercial society. Nothing wrong with commerce, all right? Uh, corporate tyranny, that's bad. That's evil. Nothing wrong with us folks, you know, doing commerce. Um, I don't demonize commerce. Uh, but all of that, lostconatlibrary.com. Um, there's going to be, there, there's going to be t-shirts, mugs, phone cases. Okay. iPhone cases with Lost Conant Library art and, um, there's a uh, kaleidoscope grimoire, my films, that kind of thing. You name it. Robert Huffine, Walter, keep the logo of LCL in this format. I intend to. That's my that's my company. Been in business 20 years, and 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 the next 20 years are going to be infinitely even better. So that when I do shuffle off the mortal coil, I have something, you know, a valuable label to leave to my heirs. You're welcome, Brian. Uh, Solite wants some cool T-shirts. You're gonna be. You're as soon as they're already ready. We just got to get the link posted. That's Teespring, and um, you'll see the various cool T-shirts that are already available. Hey, you guys have seen the Kaleidoscope Grimoire shirt that I have, and that um, I think others have some of it. Um, uh, and the Hell's the Hell's Bells T-shirt. You know, and so this stuff's all going to be available there. Um, you'll be able to get that and more. I'm going to be adding more and more. Nick N asks, any further progress on the set miniature stuff for the film? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, I got real busy. Everything got prioritized down a level when, quite frankly, my producer really needed me to focus on um, a specific request from the network. Okay, so I've been busy. I was busy for the most of two months. Anybody will tell you with just working my butt off, um, digging out and getting what they needed um, to uh, essentially green light a TV show because they really, 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 really like the concept and really want to do it. So David Paff says EMF proof baseball hats available. Hey, there's an idea, right? foil lined or something i like that brian smith a black t-shirt with lost con at logo would be super cool yes don't you know it um i thought of that years ago and i should bring that back you're right uh black t-shirt with the with the logo i think you guys have seen the white one with the logo um but uh that'll that'll be coming the black with the red logo Rui gonsalves says walter glad for your new format very nice and cool good vibes thank you thank you Appreciate it. And uh, let me see. Um, you guys know I, I like to build models. I uh, uh, received two new models in the last couple of weeks. I am going to do uh, a recorded little, you know, extra during the week, I think, on my recent model updates and stuff, my model kit building. So look for that. Nick N., says uh, he was hoping for psionic helmets. <laughs> we could have all sorts of fun with, with that stuff, right? Well, I, I hope you guys are looking forward to the holidays. I do. You guys know this is my favorite time of the year, starting with October 1st. To me, that's the beginning of the holiday season because it starts with Halloween. And Halloween for me is a season. It's not just a day. Um and of course, now we're into that Thanksgiving season, which Thanksgiving here in the States is coming uh, this Thursday. Looking forward to that. Philip Blair says, I can't prove it, but I suspect Father Francis V. Tiso is one of the sources DW borrowed from to make himself sound like he had hidden knowledge. Oh, okay. Okay. Maybe that could be fun. I'll check him out, Philip. 
Um, but yeah, with Thanksgiving coming, we're having, um, we're going to have, they, they want to go ahead and do Turkey. We were going to do Cornish hens, but, uh, Liliana and, and her best friend, Melina want to do a Turkey. They're really good at turkeys, but the rest of it's going to be, we're going to have Japanese curry. We're going to have, um, we're just going to have a good, uh, smorgasbord of cool food, um, this Thanksgiving. Soul Light US Expat asks, have you looked into the Naked Bible where Mauro Bellino is interviewed about his translations about the Bible, his conclusions, where he really breaks it down, Old Testament God's ETs? No, I haven't even heard of Mauro Bellino. So thank you for the lead. I will check that out. Let's see. It's been an hour and 39 minutes. Uh, Johnny side, holidays. I'm working through Saturday. Oh, brutal. Yeah, my nephew, uh, my mom, my sister, and my nephew were going to come on Thanksgiving, but he has to work. He is a retail, you know, shift supervisor and, uh, he's going to be busy on Thanksgiving day. And, uh, so my, one of my nieces and her fiance are coming. Uh, Nick N says Cornish hens will be like chewing on a pine cone. Not if they're made right. I love them. But the nice thing about having a big old Turkey and uh, only having a few people is there will be leftovers, right? So, well, folks, it's been an hour and 40 minutes. I went on 10 minutes longer than I usually do. And uh, an hour and 40 minutes is enough, Walter Bosley, for anyone. I thank all of you who've been here in the live chat and all of you who are watching who may not be in the live chat and all of you who are watching this recorded. I hope you found it interesting and entertaining. And um, I will be here again next Sunday night. And um, I, I'm really, really going to try to get some things posted, as I've been promising, um, between now and then. Like I said, I, I got real busy with special uh, requests on a media project that I had to do. And now I'm getting caught up. Remember, uh, Giza Death Star and Giza Death Star Deployed are now available at Lulu, uh, the two of the three of Joseph Farrell's great classic trilogy, and Giza Death Star Destroyed is coming very soon. I'll have that out to you here in just days, I think. And, um, you know, so go check that out. There's going to be um, the hardcover Wonder of the Worlds coming, coming as soon as I can get it out there properly. Uh, we'd rather do it right than rush it. Uh, the Book of Werewolves, edited by Todd Wood and myself, is also very, it's going to be on the heels of, uh, of uh, Giza Death Star Destroyed. Um, and I'm going to have another little surprise for you in the classic fiction reprint category. And you'll see that. It'll be posted. So um, again, um, if you haven't seen the film, 1937 version, forget the 1973 one, the, the 70s version, go see the 19, get your hands on the 1937 black and white Frank Capra version of the film Lost Horizon, okay, I think you can watch it on YouTube even, but also if, you've, if you're interested in what I've been talking about, read the novel, this novel by James Hilton, um, I love this paperback edition because I just love the, the, the art and, and just, wow. It's just a cool little book. And uh, and it's a great story, too. As I've said, I've read this three times myself. And um, check it out. And check out the other, the other books that uh, I referred to. So anyway, everybody in the States here and Canada, um, enjoy your, your holiday this week. And uh, I will see you guys next Sunday. Remember to go to lostcontentlibrary.com and remember to go to lulu.com to get the books and I will see you next time.